You know, after taking a look at these guys, I'm surprised more dungeon masters don't use them in their D&D games. Like, guys, what's going on here? As you can see here, fire giants are placed just above average in the Ordning. Oh my god, I'm part of the problem. And so the goal of today's encounter apart from making it fun, engaging, and making up for the grave injustice I contributed to is to create an encounter that's obvious route is to solve it through role-playing rather than combat while also taking a really niche moveset and getting the most out of it as possible. Hello, my name is Matt and welcome to my hidden nerdy side and today we're tackling the huge reclusive artist known as Stone. Giants. We are going to take a look at their lore, info, and abilities, and then build an encounter you can steal, modify, and plop straight into your D&D games. And to make sure this video is a decent length, we'll only be pulling the Stone Giant lore, info, and abilities that exist in the Monster Manual, which can be found on pages 152, 153, and 156. So without further ado, let's take a look at Stone Giants. So so in the Ordening, which is essentially a tier list within the Giant community, Stone Giants are under Frost Giants, which is just below average in the Giant caste system. That being said, they are still strong and mighty, just not socially seen as among the best Giants. But that doesn't seem to bother them, as Stone Giants are quite reclusive, relatively peaceful, and mainly keep to themselves. In fact, they tend to remain in caves and rocky tunnel networks that lie in remote mountain ranges few humanoids have ever traveled. Why is this? Well, they choose to live lives devoted to artistry, painting wondrous murals across cavern walls and sculpting magnificent stonework that could cause dwarves to shed tears of amazement and joy. These works of art are said to reveal meaning inspired by their god, Scoreus Stonebones, and the most talented stone carvers are appointed as leaders of their tribe, for they can best replicate the true word of God. Stone Stone giants are also skilled rock throwers, however, they don't necessarily treat it as a brute sport, but as a graceful display of athleticism, again showing their artsy nature. Although, of course, it has its combat benefits as well. And finally, possibly the most insane piece of giant lore I've ever read, and maybe even my favorite, is stone giants don't treat the world like it's the real world. Let me explain. When stone giants roam the world outside their caves, they view it as the realm of dreams, where their experiences don't feel truly real, like how a human would experience their own dreams. And because of this, stone giants don't believe they have to abide by the standard rules that apply to society outside their caves. Promises made in the dream world don't have to be kept. They can insult others without feeling the need to apologize. They can kill sentient creatures without feeling feeling guilt, give in to their innermost desires, and any other ridiculousness you can think of. Which is why people who have never seen the quiet, peaceful stone giants in their natural habitats can have poor opinions about them. Now when we jump over to their actions and abilities, there isn't a ton, but there's enough to play with. They are strong and beefy, as you can imagine, and can make attacks with their great clubs or by hucking rocks. But what separates them from other giants is their stone camouflage and rock catching. With stone camouflage, they have advantage on stealth in rocky terrain, which isn't actually that good considering they would only have a plus two to stealth, but hey, advantage is advantage. Also, rock catching allows them to use their reaction to catch a rock or similar object that's hurled at them. However, how often is that going to come up in a normal game? Unless your barbarian is practicing their shot put or a mage uses catapult, it's unlikely you'll use this ability too often. But when it does come up, oh boy, will it be a funny surprise. And hey, it just might come up in our planned encounter. Speaking of which, now that we've gone over the basic stone giant lore, info, and abilities, let's build an encounter. This encounter slash quest will be aimed at parties level 5 to 10, depending on how difficult you want to make it, and last about 1 to 2 sessions, depending on how long you want to stretch it out. The party's motivation 
animation should always be tailored to your campaign, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just say your party needs something crafted that only the stone giants would know how to craft. So what does your party need crafted? Well, it really doesn't matter so long as only the stone giants would know how to make it. It could be a key made of stone for a particularly tricky lock. It could be a magically infused stone tablet. It could be a complicated replica of some almighty religious figure only the stone giants can create accurately. It really doesn't matter, so feel free to customize it to your specifications. But at some point, your players will be directed to the remote Caspasia mountain range, where stone giants are said to be. So it will appear to be your average fetch quest, but oh, how that will change. Because as your party travels there, they will see a quirky stone giant woman wandering around, who we'll call Sosker. This stone giant woman will be muttering to herself while rubbing the ground with her hands. Then she'll start waving her arms in the air, twirl around, and overall appear quite aloof. And if your players get a really good look at her, they'll realize she has most likely not eaten or slept in days, but doesn't seem to be too bothered by it. When your players approach, she will be very open and forward with them, because currently Sosker believes she's in the realm of dreams. She might pick up your party's gnome or halfling to inspect them more closely, freely pass gas, comment on a player's funny appearance, or any other inappropriate behavior because she believes there will be no consequences. So go nuts! But we want Sosker to be likable, so don't do anything that would stop that from happening. While talking to her, Sosker will tell the party her clan is picking a new head seer, and they are deciding who it should be based on an art competition. For whoever crafts the sculpture that can best convey the will of Scoreus will gain the position. Sosker is currently on the tail end of a vision quest in the dream world, which she hopes will provide her with the inspiration she needs to win. In fact, Sosker believing this very interaction is a dream will view your party as her loyal followers coming to hear her speak the message of God, and that she's simply dreaming them. However, if your party mentions the stone object they need crafted, Sosker will tell them she can make it. All your party has to do is come to her cave. Easy peasy, right? Well, Sosker made this promise believing she would never have to keep it, so when your party arrives at the stone giant colony, it won't be quite as simple as that. But what's even weirder is Sosker will close her eyes and jump down a hole attached to a stone slide that will take her back to her home, aka what she views as the real world. But when your party follows her, Sosker will believe her connection to God is so strong that she summons your party with the power of of her mind, and that she's essentially created life. Sosker will be thrilled, because this is the first time she has ever done so, and was always jealous of other stone giants who have done the same, which your party will quickly piece together that the other stone giants most likely just brought back creatures from the surface. However, Sosker will also tell your party they need to be on their best behavior and be good little followers, for the clan has had to put down past dream creations who ran amok throughout the caves. So what does your party know at this point? Point. Well, they are in a cave full of stone giants. The giants can make what your party needs. There is a competition for the next stone giant leader, and the party shouldn't mess around too much without risk of death. If your players ask Sosker about creating what they need, she will tell them she can still make what her little followers want, but she needs the help of other stone giants. Luckily, when she becomes head seer, she can get them to do what she wants fairly easily. However, looking around Sosker's room, your party will notice a bunch of ridiculous looking statues, as Sosker sculptures will be of the abstract art form. Random shapes, lines, and so on will litter her quarters, but she says over the next few days she will make her grandest piece, win the art competition, and become head seer. While all this is going on, your players can spot multiple stone giants walk by through the tunnels connected to Sosker's cave, and as they roll their eyes at her sculptures and rave it will appear Sosker isn't the most popular stone giant. Then, halfway through your party's conversation with Sosker, a group of stone giants who overheard her rantings and ravings will come by and start to maliciously bully her, calling her art nonsense, convoluted, and by no way representing messages from Scoreus. Orweg, the main stone
Stone Giant Bully will then declare he is going to be Head Seer and everyone in the clan thinks so as well, since his work is beautiful, clear, and simple to comprehend. After the bullies leave, Sosker will look sad and confirm she hasn't won an art competition yet, but definitely will now thanks to her vision quest and from the aid her newly conjured followers will bring, aka your party. And once she wins this art contest, no one can laugh at her anymore and people will finally respect her. So through your narration, it's key to set up this underdog story, where Sosker is the likable oddball outcast who will overcome her obstacle of being a social pariah with nonsense art and become head seer. She will be weird, but in a lovable way. So how do you make a lovable weirdo? Well, we talked about it a bit already, but the key is to have her do weird and crazy things that push boundaries without crossing them. For example, if Sosker simply started killing creatures on the surface because she doesn't have to worry about the consequences, it will be much harder to latch onto her and see her as a likable character. But if she, say, has an obsession with elves and lifts up your party's elf and cuddles them like a teddy bear, yes, that's inappropriate behavior, but it's much more forgivable and likable. Another example would be if your party has a wizard and Sosker says she hates wizards because, in her words, they're just a bunch of book nerds trying to do what sorcerers can do naturally, it's gonna be much more difficult to make a connection. But if your party has a wizard and Sosker says she hates sorcerers because they're just wizards but without the hard work, that's a much easier connection for your wizard to make. Now this doesn't mean you can't hurl insults, but the insult should be playful. For example, making fun of your party dwarf for being a big hunk of fat, well, your dwarf might not like that. But commenting on the dwarf's belly by calling it a beer belly and asking if she can use his beer belly as a luscious pillow, that's much easier to get on board with. But of course remember, Sosker is already the underdog, so the fact that she's an underdog will already gain sympathy from certain players. Now this doesn't mean she doesn't have to have a personality, she certainly does, but the odds are stacked in your favor. But anyway, Sosker will get to work on her sculpture to present it in a few days. She will mention she remembers a few passing phrases from her vision quest, but needs your party's help defining their meaning. Because like how humans can't always remember their dreams, Sosker can't remember everything she saw while above ground. Now this is the truly customizable part, because at this point, you can give your players any four to six words you want. For example, they could be dragon, fence, fork, sheep, tree, and scale. It really doesn't matter. But remember, these words will represent things Sosker saw on her vision quest, aka the real world. And these words will represent the words of Scoreus that your party, as Sosker's loyal followers, have to help interpret and find the message within so that Sosker can create her masterpiece. So let your party's imagination run absolutely wild and see what ridiculousness they can come up with. As for skill checks, if you even choose to have them, you could either run a series of religion checks to see how well your player interpret this message from God, a series of persuasion checks to see how well they communicate this message to Sosker, a series of deception checks to see if your party feeds Sosker some juicy nonsense, or hey, maybe your players pull out their tool proficiencies and help her out. Any one of those and anything in between can work. Personally, I would go with the persuasion checks and then just let the players vibe off what you give them, but hey, that's just me. Whatever you choose, this is definitely more of a fun roleplay experience experience rather than a skill challenge, so I'd make the DCs of said checks rather reasonable at around 15 or even 10. However, it will take Sosker a few days to create this masterpiece, and your party will have a little downtime. What they do with it is up to them, but during this downtime, Orweg will approach them and make your players an offer. Orweg will say he is the main candidate for the head seer position, since his artwork is always the best, and looking at his work and how people treat him in the clan, his words won't be some mere boast. Orwag will then tell your players if they sabotage Sosker's work, when he becomes head seer, he will make your players whatever they want. So now your party has a decision to make. Do they bet on Orwag, the more promising winner, and screw over Sosker, or do they stick with the underdog to try and overcome the odds? It's their call. Then the art competition will begin. Stone Giants will show off the their art, prepare a small speech explaining
explaining their art, and then the clan elders will vote. If your players go with Orweg and sabotage Sosker's art, then he will win the contest, make your players what they want, and they'll be on their way. But if your players stick with Sosker and succeed their checks, Sosker will end up beating the odds and winning. However, if Sosker wins, Orweg will not accept it, and will claim it must have been your party who did the work for Sosker since she's never won before. This will cause quite a stir in the caves, but the current head seer will then give a ruling, and declare this disagreement be settled with the ultimate expression of stone giant athleticism, a game of Bjarvang. What is Bjarvang? Well, essentially, it's a mixture of dodgeball and cops and robbers. Sosker and your players will be on one team, and Orweg and a number of stone giants equal to your party size will be on the other. Each team will be on opposite sides of a series of tunnels stretching about 200 feet long and less than 100 feet wide, filled with pillars, large rocks for cover, and so on. There will be two separate rectangular drawings in the middle of our playing field indicating each team's loam hall, aka jail. There will be rocks the size of softballs on the ground throughout the cave, and each player can have only up to two rocks in their hands at a time. When the horn blows, the players must pick up rocks, run around, and try to hit the enemy team's players with a rock. If you hit an enemy player with a rock, they are out and must spend their entire turn running to your jail, and only use their action to dash. However, if you catch a rock thrown at you, you're safe. The player who threw the rock isn't out though, since we're not using those dodgeball rules for a very good reason, which is your players would be screwed, because your players will have to ready their action to catch a rock, whereas stone giants don't have that disadvantage. However, you can free players from jail when a player who is not out runs into the enemy team's jail and uses their action to yell jailbreak, freeing everyone from jail as they enter the game from where they stand. Your team wins once all your enemy players are in jail. Now when we look at this, both the stone giants and your players have some unique advantages. The stone giants have the advantage of A, knowing the playing field, B, using their rock attack modifier to hit, which is a plus 9 and that's pretty good, C, having stone camouflage they can use to sneak up and surprise your party, and D, will be very good at catching rocks using their special reaction. Although it's important to note, getting hit by a rock in this game will only deal one point of damage, or else it would get a little insane really quick. However, your players will also have an advantage, since stone giants are just stone giants, and they won't have access to the plentiful amount of spells and abilities your players will. Now your players can't cast any spells directly at a stone giant, since that will be against the rules. However, they can still use spells to buff their own players and use crowd control spells such as Wall of Fire to section off parts of the map. And so this beautiful, insane game will begin to end off this already ridiculous role-playing encounter. And if your players win, Sosker will be the definitive head seer and create whatever your party desires. So, a pseudo dream quest that turns into an art competition that turns into a game of cops and robbers? I think this is all quite spicy enough, but if we wanted to, how can we make it even spicier? Well, if your players are in dire need of quenching their thirst for blood, you could have Orweg, instead of challenging your players to a game of Bjarvang, start a miniature stone giant civil war. You could also have your players meet Sosker in the middle of her vision quest instead of the end and plan a couple of encounters involving Sosker interacting with regular encounters in an inappropriate dreamlike way. And finally, what if you let your players enter the competition themselves? What insanity could they concoct with a stone giant tribe at their beck and call? But anyways, this is just one of many ways you can use stone giants in your Dungeons & Dragons campaign. But if you do use this in your future games, make sure to let me know how it goes. And of course, I am always accepting challenges, so make sure to leave your spicy ones below. Thanks for watching and indulging my hidden nerdy side.